So our next uh, lightning presentation, our next lightning presenter is Ben Payton from Virginia Tech. Uh, ben is the author of what has turned out to be the wildly popular machine learning in computational chemistry lab. Um, this is, of course, a very hot topic right now. And um, this education resource has proven um, very, very, to, it's gotten a lot of interest. So uh, Ben, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna try to just share the screen. Um, today I'm just using one monitor, making things as simple as possible in the hopes that uh, everything works. Um, how does that look? That looks great. I think you're ready. All right. So, um, like Ashley said, uh, machine learning in chemistry is a crazy popular topic right now. Um, I started in this back in, um, um, I think, early 2019. We, we had a grant funded, and then that meant that someone had to actually work on it, and it was a machine learning project. And so that's when I actually started learning about um, machine learning and, and its applications in chemistry. And something that I, I got a whole lot of were, were people asking me questions at posters and, and at presentations and things. How do you get into this stuff? Because they see that it's so popular um, and, and that a lot of people are hiring and, and you know doing really interesting things with this. Um, and so I thought I would put something together. I was already building some Jupyter Notebook tutorials for just basic machine learning applications. And I thought if I could take some of those and turn them into a chemistry application, um, it would be useful for sci for education. Uh, I'm very embarrassed to learn that it is uh, such a popular lab because I feel like there are things I could definitely do better here. Um, but I, I hope that the people that have seen it have gotten uh, some use out of it. And, and if so, you know, I hope that it's uh, given them a good start, at least, in, in you know, moving into machine learning and chemistry. Um, so I, I really wanted to just look at some really basic applications of simple machine learning algorithms um, to, to chemistry that have been done for years. Uh, some of the papers that inspired this work date back to 2017 or some of them even, even later. Um, I also took some in inspiration from a tutorial from the QC Archive website. There's uh, some phenomenal work. Uh, done um, for machine learning and QC archive by these people here, particularly Doa and Matt Wellborn, um, but also Daniel Smith. Um, and so I, I took some of the uh, some of the ideas from there as well. Um, so I've already run this because a few of the cells take just a minute to run. Um, so essentially, I try to give them a little introduction to basic machine learning. Um, essentially, we need to have a training set and we need to have a model, and that's pretty much it. Uh, linear regression that they probably remember doing in general chemistry is, you know, could be considered a type of machine learning. Um, and we're actually going to start by using a model that's just about that simple. Um, but first we need to have some mathematical representation of a molecule. And I think this is, this is a topic that is often ignored um, in presentations, posters, tutorials, that sort of thing. Um, and and I, I thought that it needed its own section in this lab um, because there are many, many different ways to represent a molecule mathematically. And, and theoreticians, we know this. Computational chemists, we know this. Um, but it's not necessarily so clear to um, a newcomer or an undergraduate how you would take a molecule, which is a physical thing, and represent it as like a vector of input values. So um, first, I just define the model where we're going to say that the energy is roughly equal to this function, where we have some representation vector x, and we'll talk about that in a second, and then it's just multiplied against some weights. And the whole point of our regression is to find the weights that map this representation to the correct energies. So nice simple model. We have some error or noise here, epsilon, that we're going to ignore. Um, and so first we need to get some molecules. We need to get some data, some training data. To do things on, um, and so I set up a uh, I set up an H2O symmetric bond stretch for them, um, and so there's actually nothing for them to do in this cell. They just run it, uh, and then the next cell plots it, 
and we just plot the SCF energy, and I think I used SDO3G. Yeah, very small basis set because the actual results don't really matter so much. Um, so we just do hartree fock in STO3G, and we plot the potential energy surface of that symmetric OH stretch. Uh, and we get to see that classic potential energy curve that is so terrible in hartree fock um, And so it looks like a simple function of the OH bond distance R. And so maybe the first thing you might actually try to do is just to use that bond distance to model this. But I want to go a little bit of a step further because... Um, later on, I want to look at a hypersurface, so I want to look at more than just the symmetric uh, OH stretching. And so uh, we're going to build what is possibly the simplest molecular representation called a Coulomb matrix, and I give the equation here. Um, and essentially, your diagonal elements are just the... Um, uh, so essentially, as you go across a column and down a row, you just go by atoms. And so the diagonal elements are going to be an atom with itself. And so you'll take the product of the charges, um, Z, you'll actually take that to the 2.4 power and divide that by 2. And that'll be the diagonal elements of this matrix. And the off-diagonal elements of the matrix will be the product of the charges divided by the distance between those atoms. And so that's kind of why we call it a Coulomb matrix, because it's giving us some approximation of the Coulombic interaction between these atoms in the molecule. And so this is actually where the students get to try out some of their programming. Um, this is the part that I want them to do, very simple. Um, I think that maybe some of these are very easy tasks, uh, but again, I've, I've not seen undergraduates do this lab, so I do wonder how easy or difficult this is for them, uh, and, I'm, and I'm always looking for feedback on that. Um, but essentially, they just, have to, um, they just have to get the distance from the atoms uh, and get the charges, which is uh, which are stored in these arrays uh, from earlier when we actually calculated the potential energy surface. So they're going to get a Coulomb matrix for every geometry on that surface, right? And then they, that all they have to do is loop over uh, the rows and columns of the Coulomb matrix. And then uh, I print out the first one and I, I give them the answer to the first Coulomb matrix so that they can check it. Um, because if it's wrong, everything else in the in the subsequent notebook steps will be possibly incorrect. So uh, I just have a bit of a check there. Uh, and then a couple of questions. Um, what would happen if you changed the units of the geometry? It would pretty much just scale your Coulomb matrix, so nothing would really matter. Um, and then why we don't scale the diagonal elements by the bond distance, that's just a bit of a gotcha to see if they really understood what the Coulomb matrix is representing. Um, the diagonal elements are an atom with themselves, so there is no bond distance between them. If we scaled them by the bond distance, we would be dividing or multiplying by zero. Right. So <clears throat> now we want to we want to get back to our model. We want to get back to trying to predict energies now that we have these Coulomb matrices that actually represent our molecules at every point on the potential energy surface. Um, so we flatten that into a 1D array C, and now we have uh, our our energies are now this function of C. Actually, this should be a C now that I look at it. Uh, that's a little embarrassing, but um, we have our C vector that is the representation, and then we have our weights W, and we want to try to find the weights W. Uh, and we are going to call on scikit-learn to do this for us rather than writing a code. Um, I feel like writing a linear regression code is rather quick, but it is something to be done in a separate lab period or maybe even a separate class. So instead we let scikit-learn do these things for us. Um, and I ask them a quick question about the, the size of these things. Um, if the feature vector C is just the matrix but then flattened, how many elements should be in our weight vector? Uh, and we know we're taking a dot product here, so we know that it should be the same number of elements as in C, which is n by n, where n is the number of atoms. Um, so again, just sort of checking if they if they understand the shapes of what we're actually using here, um, and, and I think that that helps. So here I do most of this cell for them once so that they can see it, where we, uh, we set up a training set of four random places on the potential energy surface, uh, and we take those Coulomb matrix values and those energies, and those become our X and Y values for the training set. And then our prediction set is everything else. Um, so all the test points are going to be everything 
uh, except deleting the training points out. Um, and then we can append the Coulomb matrices and the energies of those to our test x and y values. And then we just use linear regression dot fit to get our uh, to get our regression coefficients, those uh, w from before up here. And uh, then we can call uh, the predict function on the test set and see how it does. And it does poorly, uh, not so surprisingly. Um, and this is partially because we use such a simple model, linear regression, and also partially because we only used four training points. Um, and so the next step is to go to a more sophisticated model where I give a little less details about the model because, again, this is something that you would maybe discuss in a different lab or, or in a different class altogether. But we move to a, to a more, uh, we move to a better model, a more complicated model at least, um, called kernel ridge regression. And we do have a very similar expression for kernel ridge regression where we have a, this is essentially a dot product of these vectors, and we have some weights, w, except instead of the representation, we actually have this k. Uh, and this is a kernel of the representations. Um, and I say down here, the kernel measures the similarity of two inputs, x and x prime, where x is the point you're interested in, and x prime is a training set. Uh, so define the training set as x prime up here. Whoops. That doesn't have to be done. There we go. Um, I also give the expression for uh, finding the regression coefficients w. Again, the student doesn't have to do this, but I find that giving the expressions uh, makes things a bit more clear. And this way, I can also point out the hyperparameters alpha and gamma, um, which is another additional thing in this model. We now have uh, hyperparameters, which are parameters of the model that are not these weights. Uh, and so I explain that here. Um, they're optimized by just trying many different values and then choosing the combination that gives the best results on a subset of the training set, and we call that cross-validation. Um, and again, this is somewhere where there might be some additional explanation needed, depending on how curious the students are. Um, and again, I'd, I'd be interested to see how many students would maybe like more explanation in this section. Um, but then we can do the same thing with scikit-learn. <clears throat> uh, we can build our kernel ridge model. Uh, and we just choose the kernel as RBF, radial basis function, uh, which is defined up here. And then we define our parameters. We know we have alpha and gamma, and then um, we have to define a grid for them to be optimized on. And this is, this is done the first time for the student. So we want to try 12 points from 1e to the minus 12 up to 1e to the 12 um, for alpha and gamma. So just a big, broad grid um, on a, logarith a logarithmic scale. Um, and then we build the model. Uh, so we're going to use grid search CV, like I said here, um, and then I pass in some parameters that they don't really need to worry about. Um, and from then on, it's the same. You call fit on the training set, and you call predict on the test set, and you can plot the results. Um, and here, we get a much better model. Uh, I've done an inset plot here. Um, in this lab, I've done the plotting for them <clears throat> because I, I didn't realize how much they learned about plotting in the uh, MOLSI tutorials, so I think that that might be one change that we can make is um, having them do some of the plotting for this lab. Um, but here, they're actually, the uh, machine learned model is so close that we actually need to do an inset uh, and see that they are within uh, maybe milliharchries or less uh, of each other, these surfaces. So that does quite well. Um, and then, you know, the thing that they learn is that more parameters um, gives you more flexibility in the model, essentially, and uh, the model works quite well. And then you can move on to something larger, like not just the OH stretch. <clears throat> so here, uh, I have them build a hypersurface. Um, and I think I give them the setup for all these. I'm just going to pull up the student version of this really quickly. Um, yes, so for the hypersurface, this is what I give them. Um, I set the basis to STO3G. I initialize these arrays for them, um, and then uh, I have them fill those in, right? So basically this part is the code that I ask them to write. It's very similar to the potential energy surface from above, except now it's going to be in a double loop um, because we're going to look at both OH bonds stretching asymmetrically at the same time. Um, so they need to... <clears throat> 
they need to uh, make a list of bond lengths, and I tell them to just use 16 fewer bond lengths this time. Um, and then you can you can make this hypersurface, and I print out the maximum and minimum energies of these surfaces just so that you get an idea of <clears throat> uh, what the energy well is sort of like. Um, I may delete this actually because I don't have text around it, but. Um, so then we, we plot the hypersurface uh, around the two OH bond lengths, and um, I actually subtract off the minimum value of the energy here, uh, just so that we can see the difference from the uh, energy minimum to every given point, right? So the lowest point on this should be zero, and that should be the, the well, uh, the potential well. And so we have quite a broad well here, uh, right around zero, and then we have some changes as we move the OH bonds, but uh, you really see that um, the molecule is quite stable to asymmetric stretching of the OH bond within, you know, quite a long range of, of stretching. <clears throat> do you want to skip, um, do you want to just skip to the, to the end in the interest of time, yeah. and then we can um, take more questions in the chat? Sure. Yeah, so this, this goes pretty much just like the previous one, except on a surface, and it can go well or not, depending on how they choose their training points. Um, then the next thing, uh, I have them predict atomization energies from a larger data set, the ANI-1 uh, machine learning data set. This data set has already built the features and everything for them, so they really just need to load it in uh, and test it. So I have them build a training set um, of the Coulomb matrices built from these molecules, which I think I have a thousand different molecules, yes, in this set, uh, and a hundred test points. So I've had them build a training and test set out of these, and then use the model that they trained, uh, or that they, that they found uh, for the water hypersurface, and they retrain it on these data. Um, and I have them plot the error in the training and test sets here in a violin plot so that they can get an idea of how well this works when we move to um, many different atoms instead of the same molecule over a potential energy surface. Um, so chemical transferability is sort of what I'm getting at here with this model. Um, and I asked them whether or not the errors are significant or negligible, and here I'm really just looking for them to um, think about what chemical accuracy is. Earlier in the lab I said that it's 1 kcal per mole, um, so I'm really just looking for them to Google the conversion between kcal per mole uh, and Hartree's and see about where this lies and then see if it's outside chemical accuracy. And so uh, that is the end of this lab. Um, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that's done for them, but I hope that there's enough pieces that, that they do that they still get something out of it. <laughs>